Exciting. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Digital Food Week TV. We are here for the week to celebrate and shout from the rooftops about the incredible food and drink industry we are blessed with here in Leeds. It's obviously been a really, really tough year. So we are saying they are back and they need you. This is a Chapter 81 production in association with Leeds Bid, the people behind Welcome to Leeds. My name is Johnny Ianson. It's not just me here because we can't just talk about food. Of course, we have to talk about booze, which is where my friend and yours, Larry Budd, comes in at Booze Corner. Johnny, what a terrible, terrible job to have been given to look after Booze Corner for the week on Digital Food Week TV. On this very desk, we're going to have cocktails made. Don't worry, I'll make sure one or two head in your direction. Good boy. Not only that, I have spent a good few days at five different breweries across Leeds sampling their delights. So we'll bring you those through the week as well, Johnny. Uh, no matter what you say, it is work. Uh, so let's have a look at what else is coming up on the show this evening on Digital Food Week TV. Uh, really looking forward to bringing and welcoming to the sofa our first guest of the evening. Uh, that's Liz Cotton. We'll also have spices with Melanie Hadida. And looking forward to some of that tasty, tasty booze with Lawrence Woodrow Smith. Uh, more and more is here talking street food. We'll have North Brew Company with more beer. And we talk meat with Ox Club. We're out, uh, we're out and about with Hyde Park and finding out what the food situation's like over there. Simon Fogel's talking the indie food industry and live music from In the Morning Lights. Uh, it's going to be a cracker. Uh, so let's say hello to our first guest. Then you may have seen her on MasterChef in 2016. She then went, op uh, went to open the refined and renowned home restaurant in the middle of Leeds and has become the first person to ever open up a pub in Leeds Kirkgate Market. Welcome to the show, Liz Cottam. Hello, Liz. Hi. How are you? I'm all right. How are you? Are you OK? Because I imagine uh, that for a chef, lockdown has been a pretty testing time, has it? Um. Well, yes and no. It's been a combination of being extremely frustrating, challenging and scary. Um, and then having lots of time to do the stuff that you don't normally get the amount of time that we've had during lockdown to do, which I really weirdly enjoyed. Yeah, you do. I think that's one of the things that's come through a lot of people that I've spoken to that work in the hospitality industry is that there is the undoubted downside of, of just not having customers and not having that work, but also the time has been a, a, a massive help as well because you're so frantic. Usually you don't get to do this kind of this stuff. Yeah, I mean, personally for me, um, I've really kind of found a creative groove that I didn't have before and I would never have had that without lockdown. So so I, I wouldn't change a thing. I've got to be honest, I wouldn't. I really wouldn't. Um, I've got a lot more out of this than... And I suppose you remember um, just how all the good things and you delete all the bad things, don't you? Yeah, and you remember yeah. how you deal with these things. But um, but yeah, yeah, for us as a, as, as a, as a team, we're, we're stronger, we're doing better things, we've got more context, we've, we've had time to think about what we do and why. And yeah, it just seems to be, um, coming out of it, it just seems to be a really, really good position to be in. I imagine it's also given you a little bit of time to contemplate your journey up to this point i mean it wasn't that long ago that we saw you first on on master chef <laughs> and now you are one of the most renowned chefs in the city and that's only happened in the last five or so years yeah i mean it's um it, it's been a bit of a whirlwind um uh, for sure and um <laughs> reflecting on what we've done and what i've done personally um yeah it's it's, it's quite surprising when you've got the time to think about it um, but in a weird way, I think where I've personally um, got to, the, 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 the most amount of ground has been covered in the last year. Yeah. Um, yeah, more time to kind of reflect on what I want, what I want to create, um, how I want to do what I do. Um, it's, it's, it's just been an absolutely amazing part of the journey. Um, a, a chapter that's given me a hell of a lot. Yeah. Really, truly. We'll, we'll talk about what else is coming for you throughout the course of the show and there, there are I guess two really exciting points it is a new venture opening up but also home is moving I can't imagine that's that's an easy thing to deal with moving an entire restaurant <laughs> no. I mean it sounds horrible yeah it is it's, just, it's really really hard I mean there's loads of like brilliant 
opportunities to do things better, both from a um, an equipment point of view, which, you know, for us chefs, it's really important to have the, the, the right tools to do the job. Um, and, you know, all the things that don't work brilliantly for us where we are in terms of the, the, the building, it's great to be able to look at a new place and design it so you don't have those problems. However, you've got a million things that you need to plan. You've got a million decisions to make. And, um, and then you've got to kind of coordinate that with the availability of deliveries of equipment because of Brexit and COVID and, um, you know, all the contractors are really busy at the moment as well. So um, it, it, it's, it's a big undertaking. Yeah, mm. it really is. Mm. Uh, and at that same time, you've chosen to open up an entirely new venture as well. You don't like to do things by halves. <laughs> no, I keep saying to people, um, you know, for, for me, I'd prefer to be uh, pregnant with twins rather than go through two pregnancies. You know, like, let's let's just get it over with and then, you know, we can get back to... Are you going to say you're doing that as well at the same time? Though? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about Cora then. So this is a bakery that's opening up soon-ish. Yeah, um, like I say, you know, there's um, there's a lot of problems with receiving things that you need, like, bakery ovens we still don't have that yet at Cora um, but the minute it arrives then we'll be opening up so that that should be early June at the latest really um, yeah all being well you're gonna stick around with us tonight gonna eat some food gonna drink some drink share some cocktails with Larry well, well if you're lucky if <laughs> uh, I think there's enough to go around uh, of course it wouldn't be a food program without actually seeing people cook the stuff in the first place. And that's why we're cooking with Beth. Beth Parsons is out and about for us all week at some of Leeds' best known restaurants. Uh, and tonight she's in meaty, meaty heaven. Welcome to Ox Club, based here in the ground floor at Hedrow House. We're going to be cooking up some lamb dishes today. And I am joined by Morgan and Andy. Hello, hello. both of you. Hi, hello. Let's get the lamb straight on because yeah. that's something I'm very, very excited about. Absolutely. So, Andy, tell us a little bit about this. What is what is this dish? What is this cut? What is this lamb? So we're doing a lamb rib dish, um, two bone in lamb belly. It's a swelled ale lamb from um, James Hall in Arncliffe. Um, you flip it. There we go. Yeah. Flip her on over. Yes. You're just going to get that seasoned and chuck I'm it on, Andy. I am indeed. Yeah, okay. so we get this from um, a supplier, so it's Swaledale Butchers. So they're based in Swaledale, North Yorkshire. Um, and, uh, and as Andy said, it's from Arncliffe. This it's about thirty miles away. Um, we try, we try with all of our meat, really, don't we, Andy? To basically yeah. get it from, get it as uh, locally sourced as possible. Uh, yep. Um, and I don't know if you want to talk about Swaledale a little bit and sort of what they do. Once you've got it on the fire, that is. It's very uh, rolling hills, isn't it? Swaledale. Yeah, Swaledale, yeah. We've got lovely, sheep up the mountain, hikers yeah, around. Yeah, the, uh, the lovely, lovely hills in North Yorkshire. Uh, Let's talk a little bit about the fire because yeah. that's not exactly a, I don't want to say it's an abnormal way to cook. It's how we cooked when we were cavemen and women. Um, but it is, it's, what's it called? A solid fuel grill, yeah, I read so, on your so, website. Um, yes, yeah, so, uh, the Grillworks Grill. So it's from, uh, it's from Michigan. There's a company called in Michigan called Grillworks. It's a completely solid fuel, has two separate modules that each move up and down. Oh, wow. You can um, raise yeah. and lower the, the ingredients towards and away from the coals. So we're still cooking about here. Get them back down. What we, what we cook over is, um, is a mixture of woods, a mixture yes. of charcoal. Um, so this is from um, Leeds Coppice Works. We're a solid fuel grill restaurant. Yeah. That just doesn't mean we just grill meat. We, um, we've got a lot of really interesting vegetable dishes um, and again it basically it's just it's an enhancing them with the grill and with the fire yeah. like we've got a really so we're just actually this is a, men, a dish from our new menu which we're just in the process of finalizing this week we've got a cook off with our staff tomorrow um and we've got a really we've got some a couple of really nice vegetable ones on the new one haven't we yeah we've got some uh we've got a new potato dish we've got cauliflowers we've got uh like new this season asparagus as well mm -hmm. um yeah just like a real variety really um and so veggies needn't be scared. Oh, it's absolutely not. not. Yeah, we'll just pop it there. So that, yeah, so that's the lamb just coming off the grill. Um, you cooked it for what about eight minutes? Yeah, is it eight minutes? And then you're going to rest it for at least sort of four, so at least yeah. half the time. For about half the cooking time, typically, you would rest it for. Doing a thermometer. Just checking, yeah, just so we, okay. we do tend yeah. to use probes quite a lot because obviously, especially if you're cooking a, a piece of meat, you can go, "That looks done," but does it? Yeah, and it's you only get one. You only get one chance to cut it. True. Yeah. Um. So, and then, like we said, if it's taking forty minutes, you don't have time to do another one. No. 
No, we don't. And that's a lot of wasting money and wasting meat, isn't it? It that's is, yeah, which again away. is something that we absolutely don't want. I'm going to glove up. You're going to glove up. Okay. There might be a bone at the bottom of this that I'm going to have to have a. There we go. There we go. <laughs> wow. Yeah, so as Andy was saying, you see, we've got sort of a really. We've got the colour gradient all the same rather than what you're saying, what you, yeah. what you get from not resting it, as you'd get one colour in the middle from where. Um, and then, like another more cooked one. Like, just, I see. if he took it off and cut it straight in half, chances are probably it would look raw in the middle. Yeah. Because it hasn't, the, the temperature hasn't had time to just even out. It looks, it's like comfortable, isn't it? It's, yeah. it's kind of yeah, settled just, itself. And if you know, if it, if like, like we said, all that, all those juices that you, that would, would come out normally if you cut it straight away without resting it, mm -hmm. you can see there's not, there's not, there's a very little coming off it. Oh, they look really good. And so this is on oak wood. Yes, this so is over it's uh, swell little lamp um, uh, cooked over oak and um, finished with a mint sauce spiked with wild garlic. Here we go, minty. That looks so nice with the green, doesn't it? Yeah, it's just that, and it's that sort of like we do try and pair classic flavors like lamb and mint sauce is what everybody wants, and it's such a such a Yorkshire staple as well. It's something that you know. We, we want to do dishes like that that sort of do go together, but do it in a slightly different one. Lollipop. Okay. <laughs> I'll do it with you if it makes you feel better. You will lollipop with me? Yeah. Okay, yeah. let's lollipop together. Right, so yeah, right. just go for it. Okay. So one. Which part are you going to lollipop? Just got to eat. So, yeah, just eat it from that way, so cheers. Okay, I'm going to make a mess. <laughs> cheers. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Okay. okay. Do you want to oh. bite them? Do you want to chop a bit and then you can put it off easier in one? No, I feel like I should just, I need to go for it now. Should we get bibs What's there? that? You're scared, are you? Well, yeah, I've yeah. Got, you've got a bowl to go over. Mm. Mm. Right. There we go. Perfect. Oh, my goodness. That's really good. Great lollipopping. Mm. You've done that before. Yeah, good effort, team. Mm. <laughs> Sorry. It's not the, uh, mm. not the most camera-ready thing to eat. Well, thank you so much. No problem. No worries. Thanks for coming. Really, really good. And I'll be back and I'm going to have that cauliflower again. <laughs> oh, <wait. laughs> Amazing. Great. Thank you. Thanks thank for coming. You. Cheers. Cheers. Uh, Lollipopping, apparently, with Beth Parsons. That's a thing. Uh, Liz is here, but that was just at the Ox Club, by the way. Uh, and I have to say, even as a vegetarian, that that meat looks amazing. And there is something that we are very, very blessed with here in, in this region in particular. And that's good meat, I think it's fair to say. It must be great as a chef having all that kind of produce so nearby. Yeah, it, it is. And I think it's, it's, it's really nice to build relationships with people who are, are, are supplying things like meat for you. Um, but we also have lots and lots of great vegetable kind of producers locally as well. So, yeah, we're God's own country. It's where all the best stuff comes from, right? Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, we mentioned at the, the start of the show that you're the first person to open up a pub, an actual pub in Leeds' Kirkgate Market. And what a building that is, by the way, to have something like that. It's just beautiful in there. It must be great to work in there. Yeah, um, it's a stunning, stunning building. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to do something in it was because it's just such an iconic um, building in, in the whole of Europe, not just in the region. Um, and it's kind of underutilised, I think. I'd like to see more and more people um, take my cue and see it in that way and, 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 and do stuff in it. Um, but yeah, it's an inspiring place to arrive every day. Um, it's full of kind of rich leads culture as well which you know characters. Is very, characters a lot of characters entertainment yeah, is, yeah, yeah. Uh, in abundance there really really truly is but yeah it's uh, it's good fun it feels like as well the market much like leads itself has, has gone through this kind of mini revolution recently in terms of the food that's available in there and, and the producers and, and the indies that have popped up in there as well yeah um, i'd like to see more of that as well i mean it's, it's fantastic we've come a great leap forward i think in the last couple of years um but yeah, it's um, it's what it's meant for, isn't it? You yeah, know, the market. It's it's about independent. It's about diversity. It's about um, just being able to kind of soak up everything that our culture has to offer. So yeah, I, I think it's I think it's made a big stride forward in that respect. Yeah. Speaking of pubs and soaking it up, that's probably a 
Nice juncture to cross over to Larry. I love soaking it up. <laughs> and, uh, you know, the Owl is a great pub, as, as you'll know if you've had a drink in there. It's, this is the pub in Kergate Market, by the way. And I don't know if you know this, but the beer has to come from somewhere. And I thought, as my job in Booze Corner this week, it would be a dereliction of duty, really, if I wasn't making sure that that beer going to our great local pubs was up to scratch. So I've spent time at five local breweries. And first up, it's North Brewing. <laughs> We've come to Meanwood, to one of the biggest success stories of brewing in Leeds in recent years. It's North Bruco's Springwell site. And let's do what it says on the sign and go have a drink at the brewery. Look at the size of that tank. How are you doing? Hello, hi. How are you? Great, how are you? I'm fine, thank you. At the risk of sounding like a weird uncle at a Christmas <laughs> yeah. party, you have grown. God, anybody, it's all right, isn't it? Anybody yeah. who knew North from North Bar, <laughs> or, you know, the top yeah. end of town, little tiny bar, beautiful yeah. Belgian beers, yeah. some nice smoked sausage every now and again. Yeah. <laughs> and now look at this, it's absolutely ginormous. Definitely, yeah. Yeah, wow. Tell me about Springwell then, because this, this is all brand new, isn't it? We started work on Springwell right in the middle of a pandemic. Um, there were a few kind of testy conversations going, every pub in the country is shut. Is this the right thing to do? It's a 21,000 square foot brewery. So it is a lot bigger. I think you can fit something like 11 North Bars in here or something like that. Like it's, it's quite a bit bigger. At the moment we're in the tap room. So we are open here Friday, Saturdays and Sundays. And I just asked you to keep your wits about you because it's a working brewery and they are brewing today. So how much beer do you <laughs> brew here in, so, in a week or a month? Or? Well, our capacity is going to be 2.8 million pints a year. Wow. So it's quite a bit bigger. So we have doubled moving here. When we opened North Brewing Co. in 2015, we doubled every single year since then. That's mad. So six just, years. Six yeah. years old and you're doing nearly 3 million pints yeah. a year. So we've, That's insane. At the old brewery, we were fitting in tanks wherever possible, and it just got to the point where we couldn't squeeze any more out of that space. Yeah. Um, here, we've been brewing here since January, so we've been brewing here for four months. We're already having conversations about where we could put more tanks. It's wow. like That's pretty amazing. surreal. Andy's brewing today, so at the moment he's emptying the mash tun here. Right. So this is the grain that gets pumped in from the really big tank that you see outside. Yeah. It gets milled, it comes in through these pipes here, and then here it gets steeped through hot water. So that's what gives the beer its colour, it detects the ABV and loads of flavour of the beer as well. This is what smells so, so nice This is as what well. smells so good. So whenever you Don't go past a brewery, this is what you can yeah, smell. Yeah, yeah it's got that nice. real yeah. kind of brewing, brewing flavour to it. And then once we've mashed in the beer, it will go into the kettle. So you can see the beer bubbling away in there at the moment. Yeah. So it's been boiled with the first load of hops um, and it's this kind of where it starts to transform from water to wort to beer. I don't want to think about your energy bills. <laughs> well, let's walk back through because it's a bit noisy it's around the It's a little bit tanks. noisy back here, yeah. I, I don't want to get in trouble with Andy. <laughs> yeah. What do you think it is about Leeds that, um, that lends itself so well to brewing? I think Leeds has got, it's obviously got a real history of brewing, but it's also got a real history of good bars serving good beer. I'm obviously biased, but like North Bar was the first place I ever tried Cantillon. It was the first place I ever tried Sierra Nevada Pale Ale and things like this. And North was the first place to ever pour Brooklyn Lager in the UK, which is mad to think about how kind of popular that is now. And from my experience, you know, it was going to North Bar, the first place that I had like an Orville yeah, or, uh, yeah. you know, or a Maiselsweiss or, you know, it's, it's sort yeah. of a lot of European beers as well that Definitely. you couldn't get regularly around Leeds. Yeah. Speaking of beer, yes. given that we're here, we should probably try yeah. a little bit before we go. Absolutely. So, so is, is there a beer that if someone came into North for the first time, that you would say, look, try this. Is it the Sputnik that you were talking about? Is it the so Pinata? Be... That's a personal favourite. It would be Sputnik, but because you're filming me here at Springwell, we need to try Springwell Pills. We wanted to make something that was really, really tasty, 
had a bit of character, but still super crisp, refreshing, and the kind of thing we'd want to drink after a shift in a hot brewery in the summer. So yeah, we've amazing. tweaked it a couple of times. We've been developing the recipe, but um, we're really, really pleased with how it's tasting. Well, it's it's nearly so, lunchtime, exactly. so I think, that, I think this is fair enough. Cancel the rest of my day. <laughs> <laughs> oh, tough job, Larry, bud. You play the weird uncle at a wedding very convincingly, by the way. Yeah, well, I've had enough of my own, you know, so, <laughs> so I'm happy to take on that one. Yeah. No, but it was, it has been a real tough gig yeah, uh, to looks go it. around a few breweries in Leeds and to try all their beers, you know. If anybody wants that job, then yeah. sorry, it's taken. There is something, I mean, it is like, it's straight from the source. It's mother's nectar in a brewery drink, yeah. and, and thankfully... Loads of our breweries are opening up tap rooms as well, so yeah. you can get it straight from source. It does. It is different there, isn't it's it? It's totally different. I love it. And years and years ago, there's a pub called the Fox and Newt in Leeds, which had one of the first microbreweries yes. um, downstairs, and they had to like build the pub around it. So those tanks are never coming out, by the way, yeah. uh, this week. Uh, but you could go and have a basically a pint straight from where it was brewed. And I, I always remember that day thinking, "Oh, this feels really nice." And you can do it in so many places around Leeds now. We're, yeah properly blessed for it it also makes me realize just how progressive temp in bowling was down at uh cardigan fields in kirkstall because they also on. had one of their own brewery do you remember they also had one Did of they? the first brewery tanks on site yeah bizarrely behind the bowling alley Amazing. yeah it's true uh Liz cotton's here uh i was going to ask you about temp in bowling but we'll stick with booze instead <laughs> uh you have home which is obviously a refined restaurant you have the owl as well which is a bit more relaxed in kirkgate market and you've brewed your own beer as well as part of that yeah, yeah. I mean, um, opening a pub in Kirkgate Market, we wanted to be traditional, but at the same time do things a little bit kind of current as well. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, basically had the opportunity to work with Northern Monk on a on a beer, which was to go with my food. And, yeah, it was a really good process. And everyone loves it as a beer. It's, it's worked really well. There's obviously been that explosion of craft beer and craft ale, right? And, I mean, if you'd have spoken to people 10 years ago, it, they would have had a very stereotypical view of people with beards and woolly jumpers and what have you. You cannot avoid the fact that craft ale is everywhere now, including in far more refined places, because it's seen as a, as a legitimate foodies drink. Yeah, I think you can do so much with the recipe and the flavours in there that it's a, a natural pairing with food. You know, it's um, really versatile. And and it also, it's kind of just a, um, a, a nice way to, 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 to widen that portfolio of things that you can have with food as well. Wine's a bit one-dimensional, so I think it's good. It's, it's a good thing. Yeah. What's your favourite kind of beer, by the way, Larry? I'm a big fan of like a fruity. I, I quite like the fruity milkshakey ones that. Oh, has like a really? Really? And, and I like mango flavors. Yeah. So, so north where I'd just been, they do a beer called Pinata, which is a which is a mango and guava yeah. pale, and that that is stunning. That's one of my favorites. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we'll be talking beer throughout the course of the show, and we've got cocktails coming up from Domino uh, in a moment's time as well. Uh, we can't talk about food in Leeds, though, without a street food scene either, which is absolutely buzzing. Uh, so we'll be hearing throughout the course of the week from all our different vendors, or certainly lots of them, uh, starting tonight with a real Mediterranean flavour. <laughs> Hugo Moneypenny from uh, Momo, uh, also known to be of Good Boy Burger and Paisano uh, Trattoria Moderna, which means modern little eatery. I've always loved Middle Eastern food. Uh, it's always been like my go-to. I've always made it. I've always eaten it. Um, and I once, when I was a bit younger, went to some street food events in London and was walking around and was like, I could do something like this. And I had some friends that at the time were like, I was a bit like, not really sure what to do, what path to go down. Um, and some of my friends were like, you should, you should use your passion for food and your talent and stuff and do something with it. Um, and so I was like, okay. And then um, I approached Ben Davey, who was the executive chef of Hedra House Belgrave at the time I was working at Hedra House. And um, he let me use some equipment, uh, came up with a brand, came up with a menu. And that was the very end of 2017. And I went full time with it in 2018. It kind of found a bit of a gap in the market, making the healthier side of street food. Um, obviously now we do like deep fried halloumi fries and stuff, but we're still very focused on like fresh ingredients. Everything's made homemade by us. Um, everything from your pickles to your sauces, 
to your marinade, to your spice mixes. Um, I just really try to tap into the kind of like homemade, healthy, super tasty, everybody wants some more more. Uh, good boy burger, no. Uh, my favorite street food to eat that's not mine. Um, I'm gonna go for, you know what? I'm gonna go for those guys, Chinese, Japanese dumplings. I ate them earlier and I was like, they're really good. Um, those guys, those guys, and those guys. These are all the best guys. Uh, but mainly these guys. Oh, so we've, uh, we're in a tent because we just, we, we just love to be in like a, a hot black tent cooking over grills. We like to make it hard for ourselves. But as of today, um, our 1967 food truck has been fully valeted, uh, MOT'd, it's running. So from now on, you'll see us trading out of our 1967 Fiat food truck. It's pretty cool. As long as it doesn't break down on the motorway somewhere. Uh, guaranteed. It's guaranteed to do that. But... Um, Touch wood, you know, it won't. Glass is always half full. So we've got a little bit of a break now um, until the end of June. So we can, because we're opening a site in Liverpool. So we want to make that running really smooth. But then we're going to be back at, um, at Chow Down. We're going to be at um, Harrogate Food and Drink Festival, North Leeds Food and Drink Festival, uh, Northern Monk twice. We're going to be there with Good Boy Burger and more more. Hopefully trading out with the van both times. Um, we're going to be at Magic Rock Brewing, um, Bustler Street Food Market in, not in Derby, um, and loads more. Although I can't think of something in my head because I've just got shawarma and stuff in my eyes. You know what the hardest thing about street food is working in the rain. We recently did um, a weekend, bank holiday weekend at Beck and Call, and the Monday was just like biblical, and literally we didn't sell, we didn't sell anything. And it took us like four hours to pack, break down. I think we stopped serving at three. We got into the van at like 7.30. And it was just like drenched to the bone. Nothing would fit in the van. Uh, and also having to put up with people like you. That's the, uh, that's the hardest bit. Mm. Uh, but no, it's, 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 it's a ride, you know, it's a vibe. It's street life. I really like experimenting with meats. Uh, so at the moment we're doing like a lot of like funky like water bathing meat. So we made a lamb donna, which we like, we pressed and then we cooked in a sous vide machine and then we finished off in the grill. That's quite interesting. Um, you know, we do stuff with, like beef, um, beef rib, uh, like uh, pork fillet, making giros out of pork fillet. Then we then sous vide, sous vide and finish over flames, um, stuff like that. But I, I like just, you know, I really like, like making the burgers because it's such like a simple product, but it's just like, it's, and it's really easy to make, or really simple to make. Um, but it's just really, really good and tasty. It's really nice. And obviously chicken shawarma, because it's just the... Uh, and falafel, I love making falafel as well. Just falafs. That's the first of our uh, street food indies this week. That's more. more. Uh, I do miss your chicken shawarma. You were just mentioning then it's a good shawarma. It's, it's one of the best shawarmas I've ever had. <laughs> I have to, and I do love a good shawarma. Yeah. I will visit cities to try their shawarma. Well, have you tried Berlin's shawarma, the no, home of the I've kebab? Been. I've never been. It's so good out there. It's so good. It's one of the things that I miss the most probably is a chicken kebab, actually, since turning vegetarian a few years ago. Um, you don't have to worry about being stuck out in the rain. No. Not doing street food, Liz. No, that's Never true. fancy doing the, the street food taster menu? Mm, not yet. I wouldn't rule anything out, but no, no. Um, but I'm absolutely loving the street food, kind of the quality and um, just the amount of um, effort everyone's putting into it. It's, 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 it's really refreshing to be able to kind of embrace cooking in so many different ways and, and get such a great output. I, I, I love going down to Chowdown and, and, and trying what's, what's out there. It's brilliant. Yeah. Well, speaking of Chowdown, that's a lovely segue, Liz, uh, because we have a big picture segment each night this night, looking at the overall industry and seeing how it's been affected and how it's moving forward throughout the pandemic and as we emerge out of the pandemic. And one of the most difficult tickets to get hold of was to chow down this big summer outdoor event of food and drink. And I've been talking to the organizer behind it, Simon Fogel, and he's been telling me about the Leeds indie food scene and what's happening next. 
So Simon, here we are, uh, chow down. We are getting excited for yet another weekend at a very busy event. Absolutely, yeah. Weekend three of 2021, I keep saying 2020, but 2021. And yeah, it's been amazing this reception. Obviously it's about to rain right now, but um, we've got plenty of cover as you can probably yeah. maybe see on the camera. So hopefully yeah, it'll be all right still vibes. I bet want. it's it's felt like a long old year getting to this point. I know oh. that the people I spoke to when that first weekend was coming of Chow Down were so excited at the prospect of it. And that was people that was eating here. So it must be even more so for people like yourself and, of course, the actual food vendors. Oh, yeah. It's, great. it's just great to see, like, the tills ringing, essentially, even though they don't ring at Chow Down. But, like, <laughs> like that first week was Not just... Not the 1970s, anyway. No, but, like, it's just the noise. It's like, ah, yeah. people earning money again that haven't probably had financial help through lockdown because they don't have premises they just they work out of their own kitchens or their vans pop yeah. up on their drives and stuff so it's kind of just nice to see like them smiling once again it's like such a, a nice treat i think there's one thing that we've we've learned as well throughout lockdown is that we as customers are desperate for this kind of thing and I think it's probably reinforced to a lot of people just how important events like this are, but just how important it is to be able to go out to your local Indian restaurant, bar or whatever, and just enjoy that experience. Oh, man, yes. Yeah. It's, it's When you're locked up for so long, um, obviously for reasons, um, just being able to, to come out, like that 12th of April in Leeds. Leeds was like, I don't know what it was. It was like a beather on, yeah. on a Saturday <laughs> night. But like everyone was generally happy just to be out seeing their friends it was like people took the day off work and were drinking from you know as soon as they could outside and yeah. you know Leeds has done it really well I think the alfresco dining scene is what everyone's calling it but like it feels like a different city almost yeah Where the sun was blitting down in Greek Street call them um, even that eat your greens down there they've got a little pocket of seating seating area it's like it's so good to see Leeds like buzzing again like that and yeah. people miss it and then you know the money is a factor for these businesses but they're more happy to see people, like, generally. Yeah. I think the one thing that everybody is hoping, customers and vendors themselves, is that maybe this will become a, a long-term change. That, you know, whether you want to call it the continental experience or cosmopolitan experience or whatever, that being outside when the weather allows will become something that becomes part of our identity as the way we eat and drink and celebrate together. Yeah, I mean, it is like it's like the European model, I yeah. always used to say. Um, you go anywhere, Lisbon, Berlin, like... Barcelona and people just are out on the streets. There's cars passing you, but you're having a coffee, chatting to your mix. You're on holiday, but it doesn't matter about them. And I think we just need to get over go over that. And you know, the council leads bid and have done a great job in enhancing the city and allowing you know the cafe street licenses to be fast tracked through. And yeah. you know, something that normally takes a three month process was taking 24 hours. And it's like, all right, that's happened, but it could have happened before. Yeah, and, yeah. But now you know, it's taking a pandemic for us to to get to that stage which is strange but it's good that everyone's positive about it and it does feel like a different city but it takes it often takes something like this right to, to cause some permanent change or, or yeah. change people's mindsets because particularly as, as councils it's very easy to get stuck in your ways oh, yeah. and actually to be forced into realizing you can do something in a different manner can lead to some really positive changes for good and th yeah. like this doesn't have to be temporary this can be a permanent shift now yeah, I mean, like when we're here at Chow Down at Temple Arches, this wasn't planned. We set this up. I say we, so it's me as Leeds Indie Food and the guys at New Citizens who used to run Canal Mills and a couple of restaurants in the town. So they, we got together, you know, four weeks we turned this around. And it's an outdoor space that we were, you know, told to use. And we created um, an event that's like Leeds is potentially biggest outdoor space for dining and, and um, drinking. So, this has come through the pandemic and we're trying to keep it as long as we can. Yeah. Yeah. And I think one of the things that it is also showed is, is that food is part of what we do and who we are. You know, we look at it from a cultural point of view. It's not just about going out and getting some sustenance. Yeah. It's about becoming part of the identity, isn't it? And food very much is a part of culture. Yes. This is a, uh, I'm looking up to the sky for an answer, but <laughs> as we receive any, and including Arts Council grants and they had this culture recovery fund they you know people deemed food not culture and that really obviously makes you feel like a bit rubbish because you know you spent six years putting on a, 
a food festival that 22,000 people like used to come to between uh, over a two week period. Mm. All the events we do 100 events, you know, some of them free, some of them ticketed. And yeah, to say that you're not culturally relevant by not giving us any money, which, which is fine, but it's just a bit of a kick in the teeth. So, but we believe, like as Leasing to Food and as Chow Down, that culture, food is culture and it brings people together. And that's what culture is. It's like, it's not just like the art forms and music and theater and stuff. It's actually having a space to bring people together. So we kind of, yeah, want to do more of that yeah. shouting that food is culture. And But I think as well, it's, it's a great opportunity for, educa for, for education, but also conversations about other cultures. And food yeah. is a gateway, doesn't exactly, it? And yeah. you've only got to look around here to see different nationalities and styles of food, that it shows the diversity that this city has. And it's always, as ever, reflected in food. Yeah, exactly. You want you want people to come together over food and chat over. Like we we you know hear conversations as you walk through site of just people like getting together for the first time, but also chatting over current politics and issues. And we do that over food and drink, don't we? And it's fascinating. Yeah, but yeah. And also like you know QR codes. I always whoever used the QR codes. Like this is another thing. It's not just culturally, but like you know our menus on a on a QR. Code like most restaurants and bars and table service. This is another thing that's come out of the pandemic is, do we ever need to queue at a bar again? Do yeah. we ever need to go queue at a street food van again? And I think like chatting to the street food traders over the last few weekends, they don't want to go back to having to cook the food and chat to the customers and take the money. That's three processes for them. Whereas they can come here and I'm pointing over there because they're just over there off site of camera. But they just want to cook the best food they can yeah. and not have to you know, take the cash because you have to have someone dedicated to taking money and you know it saves them a little bit of money but you know here at Chow Down we run the service we run the bar and try and make it as easy as possible for people to try as yeah, much yeah. food as possible and have a good time yeah and although everything is changing the one thing that stays the same is that the food has to be good the food, food you know, be good. I mean that's my job <laughs> <laughs> so if the food is bad but it needs please. to be <laughs> you know what you know you can come here with all your fancy QR codes and it looks pretty and it's nice <laughs> to be under a gazebo and all that sort of stuff but if the food doesn't taste good then what's the point no exactly we I mean last year at Chow Down here we made a conscious decision to help people that had no support literally no support and so I had to dig deep and find people that we wouldn't probably normally book but that generally needed as much help as possible and then this year we've opened it up because it was so successful we've opened it wider than just like leads so we've kind of gone a bit this is like for example we've got a couple of people from manchester and birmingham here this weekend and next weekend we've got a couple of traders from derby and you know we're trying to open it up to just eat the best food yeah which leads us seamlessly into probably eating some of that food which i think is starting to cook next to us now uh, yeah. so keep up the good work congratulations on the recovery and long may it continue Marvellous, Johnny I. Anson speaking to Simon Fogel at Chowdown about the Leeds indie food scene. This is Digital Food Week TV. My name's Larry Budd and I'm in Booze Corner, which is great because we're about to have some booze. Uh, and if you know Leeds at all, you will know that the cocktail culture has been... In fact, if you stand still too long in Leeds, you get turned into a cocktail bar uh, these days. So if you wander through, though, uh, Grand Arcade in Leeds, you might miss one of the jewels in the crown and that's domino club and that's because there isn't a sign for it you have to walk through lord's barbering in order to get to the club itself it's through a hidden back door and down some stairs it's proper sort of old school prohibition vibes is what i like to call it uh, lawrence woodrow smith is from domino and is with us uh, tonight great to have you on hi mate how's uh, it going uh, very well thank you i've described domino about right haven't that hidden behind a bar uh, yeah 100 percent. yeah yeah, yeah. Time, like it's Leeds' best worst kept secret. Yeah, um, yeah, <laughs> secret door in the back of a barbershop. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, so what are you going to make for us? I'll chat more uh, about Domino with you in a moment. But what are you going to make for us all? Uh, so we've got a new menu that's coming up. Uh, I'll make this little guy for you. Yeah. Um, so this is going to be called the High Jinx. Yeah. Uh, so it's it's like a twist on a decolletage, which in turn. That's I'm glad twist. you said it was a twist on a decolletage because uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. just the standard. Uh, yeah, it's a twist. It's a twist on a decolletage, which in turn is a twist on a hanky panky right um, just we to... might have to keep going through the twist until <laughs> yeah, i know exactly. what this drink is but... um but yeah this is a little number that's actually it was actually thrown together by by my girlfriend um and it's got so this is some uh, roasted red pepper infused aperol uh, right. is, the, is the real big 
the big yeah. twist on it. Um, and that was some gin that you put in at yep, the start? Yes, that was some of our Wolf Brothers yeah. gin uh, okay. that, that, yeah, we, we started making. So we've started making our own uh, gin, vodka, uh, coffee liqueur. And we started that in, in yeah, lockdown. Lockdown one is when that came about. Um, yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's got our own Wolf Brothers gin in there. And then some vermouth. Yep, a nice little bit of sweet vermouth. And then and this then is Fernet, which is... Um, Fernet Branca, yeah. Which you poured me a little bit off just before, because we were talking about it. You know, we've got, I've got to do my research. And this is, you said, uh, as bitter as heck. Yeah, yeah, words. yeah, yeah that was verbatim, I think, yeah. Um, yeah, it's um, every bartender's favourite ingredient. It's, yeah. Um, yeah, incredibly bitter. Yeah, Can I bitter. say it's like Jägermeister, but... But a sophisticated, bit cooler, a bit sophisticated Jägermeister. Yeah, we so can, we can go No, that. I can't say it's like Jägermeister. That's fine. The thinking like, man's Jäger. The yeah. thinking man's Jäger. That's a great quote. I think there's a few Italians that would cringe deeply inside to have it yeah. described as Jägermeister. No, welcome to invite me over to, uh, to tell me off. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, we've got this little guy here. Um, so what do? was this called again? Give me the name. Uh, this is the Hijinx. Hijinx. Yeah, so it was a hanky panky. So that was that was a, it's a really classic gin cocktail yeah. that was made by the Savoy's first ever uh, female bar manager. Uh, that then got turned into an agave twist, which was decolletage. So it's yeah. like named after like the sexy collarbone bits on a girl, and then. <laughs> That's what that's what it's named after. <laughs> it's uh, big learning experience. And then and then yeah, this was this is my my girlfriend's variation on it. It's, uh, the the hijinks. I must remember to come on at my wife's decolletage when we get home. Exactly. <laughs> I get home later on. Uh, but yeah, this is okay. this is a drinker's drink. This uh, is the one for you. you guys can have okay. one of those in a minute. Okay. Uh, uh, so we'll let those sit and then we'll we'll share them out because we need you. Stop get... teasing <laughs> and bring us the booze. No, I'm just kidding. Look, it's fine. It's fine. Bring it over a bit. It's okay. I'll let Liz. Liz got a far more refined palate. Oh, do we get one each? Johnny and Liz, you can you can go. We get one each. Here we are. You have the high drink. Such a pretty glass. It's just on a decolletage, don't you know? Okay. Okay. What else have we got then? That smells beautiful. Uh, we've then got the Russian Spring Punch. Uh, so it's it, it's like a, a, a modern 21st century version of a Russian spring punch. So like it was a Dick Bradsall classic that we've then put our own. Okay. Uh, this is actually from Roland's, so from the Domino Club's sister bar. Yeah, which is yeah. on Call Lane. Exactly, yeah. The, 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 the Mecca. Exactly, yeah, and yeah, yeah, that's where we make all of these Wolf Pro products. Um, yeah, this is our own little little twist on that. So it is um, some of our uh, Bonomi vodka we make ourselves. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we've got a zero waste citrus vodka that we make. So we gather, so like, like you've seen me just do it here, we've got uh, grapefruit twists, lemon twists, uh, limes or oranges, and we, we actually keep all of our discarded fruit and then give it to Niall, our master distiller, who then makes yeah, a zero waste citrus vodka out of it. Right, so, so that's, um, the that's the first thing in. Yeah, exactly. Uh, we've then got a, a homemade uh, raspberry sherbet. Uh, so it's a, a raspberries and this, this little ingredient called super sour that came onto the market last year. Uh, it's a blend of various different acids. So you can right. use it as like a citrus replacement. It's basically really sour water. Okay. It's the easiest way of understanding it. No relation it. to apple sours. Um, you had when you were 17. No, no, no. no, no, no. no. Yes. <laughs> Bringing me back flashbacks. Um, and then some of our uh, house wines. So we actually, we, we try to be as environmentally conscious as we can across both sides. Yeah. So we've actually started, it sounds awful to say, but we've moved to bag and box wines as our house wines. Okay. But because they're sold in like bag and boxes, they they get to spend half the amount of money on like postage and packaging. Yeah. So we actually get to buy a far better wine at a much cheaper price and then bottle it ourselves. So we get to give, yeah, a much better product that's better for the environment and at a cheaper price. Does that, that make sense? sense? Yeah, that's that's that makes right? sense to me. Yeah, yeah just about they, they used to be a real reputation, didn't there, about boxes and bags of wine, but yeah. This is it like you, you use it as well. We do, we do, we do, we do. At the owl, um we we're really short on space. Um We've got restrictions around how much waste that we can we can kind of get out of the building at different times of day, and um, we've we've gone really heavy into bagging box. They last longer. There's less. I mean, glass itself, even though it's recyclable, if you think about how heavy it is, mm. and then how much energy goes into recycling that glass, it's it, it's it's massive. So yeah, we've um, we've been working with our wine suppliers, and we've actually driven quite a lot of um, winemakers to, to to produce wine, and then look into putting stuff in bags for us as yeah. well because it just makes so much more sense yeah 100 like i'm just wondering if i can use that as a reason to start 
boxing wine and keeping it under the stairs. It's just for space reasons. <laughs> well, it's just you absolutely storage. Yeah. And I'm glad you're saying you're saying bag and box, aren't you? Because at first I thought you said bargain box. Which sounded, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> I'm really cheap. Okay, so just remind me what this one was again. Uh, so it's the Russian Spring Punch. Russian yeah, so it's, our, it's punch. our uh, discarded or, or our zero waste vodka, yeah. a homemade raspberry sherbet, some white mm. wine, uh, and then a soda water top. And that's a bit of burnt orange on the top. Uh, it's it? a dehydrated lemon on there. Yeah, it's close. So, yes. <laughs> it's almost in the ballpark. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Genetically close. <laughs> What, what is it when you say zero waste? Why? What, what makes it zero so waste? Like, so where I've cut the, the twist off the end of this, rather than just like throwing all our citrus at the, okay, in the bin right. at the end of the night, we'll put them into like freeze lock bags and give them to our distiller. And then, yeah, he makes us um, this citrus vodka out of it. So presumably each batch will be slightly different depending on what he gets. He weighs then. it all out. Right. So like he'll know that it's X amount of grams of whatever and then X amount of grams of the other. So that like, yeah, each run is actually the same as opposed to like one being like super heavily limey and then the next one being super grapefruity um yeah now now knows what he's doing just about beautiful uh, well even even though your first drink was an italian drink this one is a russian uh, spring russian but it it's, feels like something you could drink in the summer in italy yeah really really yeah. refreshing i mean it was made by an english guy in a london-based bar i've got no idea i mean it's got <laughs> vodka in it so that's where the name that's russian a, spring punch definitely comes russian from. but yeah traditional russian drink uh, and how is the high jinx? Is that good? Uh, it's terrific. Yeah, yeah really. Drink re drink. It, you can taste the booze. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of booze in this. Yeah, which is a good thing. I mean, I, don't get me wrong. I'm not complaining about it. The rest of the show is going to be fun. <laughs> uh, Lawrence, great to meet you. And Domino uh, is just to reveal the secret a bit more hidden behind Lord's Barbering the Grand Arcade. That's the one. Uh, Roland's Bottom End of Call Lane. Uh, and definitely worth a visit because the cocktails, I speak from experience, are absolutely marvellous. Thanks for coming on. No worries. Thanks very much. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, I love the fact as well that the, the man that works behind a hidden door in a barbershop is the hairiest man in the world, <laughs> by the way. Uh, obviously, food and our wonderful drinks uh, industry isn't just concentrated in Leeds City Centre. We have some amazing districts around Leeds as well, which is our man Harry John's job to go and explore. He's from Holy Mountain. Uh, and today, he's at a student favourite. Cheers. Welcome to What's The Move in collaboration with Leeds Indie Food. Today, we're gonna to be doing a recce of Hyde Park, Woodhouse, and here is a really cute dog! <laughs> Hello! <laughs> How are you? Hello! 100% keeping that in. 100% keeping that in. Shall I just, shall I just keep going? Okay, so we're <laughs> take two. We're gonna be doing a recce of Hyde Park, or Woodhouse, as it's supposed to be called. Um, I've been in Leeds 10 or more years. I'm old. And I guess Hyde Park's always been kind of like a studenty place. But in the last few years, some really cool stuff's come up. And uh, we're gonna go take a look. <laughs> it would be wild to talk about Hyde Park and not mention Hyde Park Book Club, a hub of activity, wonderful staff, great vegan food, coffee's good, serves booze, got a nice outdoor area, puts gigs on, does club nights, good people. Uh, so shout out High Park Book Club, independent spirit. <laughs> Hiya, how are you guys? One of my OG Leeds suburb recommendations is Symposium. This place behind me is sick. Traditional Greek food. I've been banging on about it for years and no one's been listening. I've just ordered a halloumi Eero. Beautiful, oh mate. Oh. You know when you just like no? <laughs> Everything's just fresh. Tastes great. Beautiful bread. Look at that, man. Really nice sauce. Symposium. Hyde Park Corner. The hustle. The bustle. Greek gear. Get into it. So we've just had some wonderful Greek food at Symposium on Hyde Park Corner. And now we're going to trek across Woodhouse to eat some old school Caribbean barbecue.
So we just walk into the wing place, but like, you can't not shout out CC Continental in Hyde Park. The food is banging, the produce is banging, the butchery section is banging. It's just sick. Hey, uh. how are you doing? You all right? So we're at Jerk Express, which I'm kind of biased because one of our best mates literally lives there. We've eaten here a hundred times, but they get up every morning, they fill the smokers up with chicken, slow Caribbean smoked barbecue jerk wings. Look at that. You mad? <laughs> you know when you like, it's just before burnt and it's that perfect like smoky, crispy, I love this place, Jerk Express, Hyde Park. We're a stone's throw away from Lupe's. Another great restaurant, old school Mexican gear. And also we walk past Hunk, which is a good vegan place if that's, if that's up your cul-de-sac. I literally just talked about you. Oh. <laughs> I was just saying that, I was like, oh, our mate literally lives across the way. Well, my window's there. <laughs> Smell it in the wide way, cook to you. Yeah, it's good, good kit. Well, you're doing a good job, man. So this has been What's the Move in collaboration with Leeds Indie Food. Hi, Park. Thank you very much to Harry, who was in Hyde Park for us tonight, and he's going to be in four other suburb of Leeds, uh, suburbs of Leeds throughout the week as we find out the foodie scene in those particular areas. Now, our next guest on the show tonight, you know, they say we're all shaped by our experiences in life, and none more so than Melanie Hadida here, who you lived in India for a while and you have become... I'm good. Can I call you the Spice Queen? Is I've, that okay? I've created the, spice the term. Girl just feels like it's taken. <laughs> I created the term Spice Sommelier, so yes. that's that's what I'm going to go with. Yes, totally doing that. So uh, thank you so much for coming on. You're going to talk to us about uh, Spice and Green, which is your uh, operation. You are uh, a master of spice. So tell us where this love came from. Yeah, you mentioned I lived in India on and off for years. I lived in an Ayurvedic clinic that treated people through a combination of Western medicine and Eastern indigenous style medicine. Um, and a lot of ways of treating people is through food and diet, especially spices and herbs. Um, at the same time, I learned to cook Indian food, which we obviously know is extremely rich with spices. Um, I have a Middle Eastern background, and so spices and herbs have always been a really big part of my life. Um, the first time I toasted and ground cumin seeds, the smell just permeated every room in the house and it was just a complete full body experience. And I kind of knew in that moment that why was I buying powdered spices? Why are we buying these spices from the grocery store? We can actually be buying whole spices, roasting them, grinding it up themselves. Yeah, it's become quite a big thing, hasn't it? Because you, you can't sort of go very far or in a health shop, certainly. And, and turmeric is the big thing at the moment. It seems to be, you know, have some ground turmeric in some water for your breakfast or whatever. It'll help with some part of your digestive Absolutely. system. You know, it seems popular. Yeah. yeah, well, the thing about spices and herbs is not only do they enhance the quality and the flavor and the enjoyment of your overall culinary experience, but there are a lot of wellness and health benefits to it. So turmeric tastes wonderful. It adds a lot to all different types of food. And then of course it has lots and lots of health benefits as well. Um, cumin seeds in particular, one of my favorite, extremely high in iron. So it's a very easy, simple way to kind of add extra flavor and extra wellness benefits to salads, soups, anything that you're cooking in the house. Yeah. And for those watching, they may have noticed that you don't have that Leeds twang uh, in the way you say <laughs> herb, for example. You're, you're Canadian? I'm Canadian, you're yeah. I'm Canadian. from Montreal and, and yes. a bit of that French uh, French yeah. vibe. And Montreal's a great city, so mm -hmm. I have to ask you about how does Leeds compare? I mean, you're in love with this city now, aren't you? Surely. I absolutely am. I mean, I'm Yorkshire, you know, Yorkshire for life now. But when I moved to Leeds, it was 2012. And I really feel like the food scene has absolutely exploded since yeah. then. It's been amazing. Um, there's some fantastic restaurants, huge street food scene. Um, 
So I'm really proud to be a part of that. Yeah. Now, this is the show and tell section of the show. And yes. We're going to find out what's in this jar in just a moment. But I did want to say this, and I'm one of these people that gets, I get into the kitchen, I quite enjoy cooking, but I open the spice cupboard. And I don't, I don't know if it's the same for you, Johnny. I, I feel like this might be the same for 80% of people. You open the spice cupboard and the fear just overwhelms you. Yeah. You don't want to get it wrong. You know, no. you're putting too much of this. You know, you've ruined something with cinnamon in the past or whatever. It, the spice does feel like sort of a scary. Yeah, because there's, so, there's so much of it. <laughs> and how do you know what to put with each one as yeah. well? So I just get salt and pepper and chili, just every meal, that's all of it instead. Because it is, it is overwhelming when you look at how much of it is there. What you do is you call Melanie and you, <laughs> tell, us, you tell us what when we're about to cook something. I mean, I've been criticized in the past for my recipe writing, um, sprinkle of this, a smidge of this, a scoop of this, a dollop of this. Really, it's all about what you enjoy and the flavors that you like. There's really no way to kind of OD on uh, turmeric. Uh, we all know that chilies can be extremely hot. So it's about what you can handle, what you enjoy and putting those combinations together. And then we always eat by smelling first. So we start by smelling the spices. We think about what we love, what we want to experience, the cost, you know, for example, cardamom costs more than gold. Uh, yeah. So that's a spice that we want to use sparingly. Um, and we want to think about the part of the world that we are taking inspiration from when we are cooking. So if we're looking at India, we're looking at cumin seeds, fennel seeds, coriander, Middle East, we're looking at nigella seeds, um, caraway. Um, so based on where we are in the world, that inspiration we're taking for our meal, that's kind of where you're going to start thinking about what spices to use. And just, just have fun with it because that's, you know, if... If you're too precise with the cooking, then it's going to become a stress stressful experience. And so it's about having fun with it and experimenting. Yeah, I mean, you say you can't go overboard with turmeric, but I did because I got teaspoons and tablespoons mixed up in a recipe right. from Ella. What's deliciously Ella, that lady? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah I yeah. did one of her recipes, which had a bit of turmeric in, but I put in a lot of turmeric. Yeah. And it was a bit, you know, those yeah, it can be very bitter. Yellow afterward. This stains terribly, yeah. that stuff. Yeah. You know, those challenges where the guys put a teaspoon of cinnamon in their yeah. mouth to see if they can talk afterwards. And it was a bit like that, but for the whole family. Okay, so <laughs> what have you got in this jar here? Because I'm excited about this. I've armed everybody with a spoon so that we can all try this. But what's in this jar? So, um, my business, Spice and Green, I make six different spice blends two Indian, two Middle Eastern, and two Canadian style spice blends. And then I also do a marinated feta. Marinated feta is um, a DOP Greek feta, uh, extra virgin olive oil. And then what I do is I add um, different ingredients into the cheese and the oil to kind of have it absorb those flavors and create a really amazing kind of charcuterie experience. Kind of like the zero waste vodka, I use a lot of citrus peel. I have a rosemary and orange flavor and a lemon and thyme flavor, but I brought my fla favorite flavor today. Um, it's a spicy garlic harissa. Excellent. So harissa paste is a uh, North African, a Tunisian yeah. condiment, um, and it's made with peppers and ground chilies and lots of spices. So what I did was I kind of took out the uh, paste elements. I took out this, the chilies and the peppers, and um, it's a combination of seeds and um, pepper flakes. So there is uh, kalanji or nigella seed in here. Those are the black seeds that we find in nan bread. So we get a lot of the nan vibes. Caraway seeds, um, which are which is in rye bread coriander cumin and then there's chili flakes and garlic cloves in the uh right. jar i'm ready to die so what happens is everything gets absorbed it in a frittata you can um it's fantastic on a greek salad so just chop up a salad you've got the saltiness from this from the cheese the oiliness from the feta and then you've got all of the spices i'm not gonna be able to breathe on anybody after this am i for a while no okay it's, it's not extremely spicy, but it does have a nice heat to it. And so you can imagine some nice flatbread, scooping it in, or just over some crunchy veggies. Yeah, I can't, I'm just going to come over because I really like cheese. Do you want me to bring this over to you, Liz? Yeah. Yeah, get a spoonful of this. Yeah. Oh, oh. I've got oil on your rug, by the way. Sorry, guys. <laughs> I wanted to see you feeding Liz Cotton from the start. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know which way he was going with that? Yeah. <laughs> oh, that's oh, that kind so of show cool. going. Mm. Right, so, so kind cool. of the beauty of this product is the longer that the cheese and the oil are taking in the spices, the more it's going to get on the flavor. Yeah. And then when the cheese is finished, you've got a really nice infused oil that you can kind of use to cook with yeah. or all over a salad. It's lovely. It's really like nice that. and balanced, actually. It's not sort of yeah. super garlicky. Yeah. Do, do, do you, because usually when you infuse things, you have to heat the oil and... 
Mix it up for days. Do you just put it in and let it soak then? I put it in and when when um, somebody buys the jar um, or I deliver it to one of my stockists, I like to have about 48 hours minimum of kind of infusion time. Um, the oil acts as a um, is a preservative for the cheese. Yeah. So it doesn't need to be stored as at a super cold temperature and it keeps it good for a really long time. Because we all know when we buy that little block of feta, we open it up. As soon as it gets exposed to yeah. the oxygen, it kind of starts to get bad quickly so the oil is a nice way of extending that life of the cheese yeah well it's been great to meet you thank you so much for coming on thank Melanie you. Hadida from Spice and Green and we can find you online we just search yes Spice and Green leads marvelous stuff uh, have you have you got rid of the feta oh the spoon's down you've got rid of the feta out of the back of your teeth yeah well, I'll I'll just, stuff let, me just, uh, bit. let me just cleanse for Wash a moment down. Time. that's an excellent idea mm. uh, so that's nearly it from us uh, we've got some amazing live music to finish with in just a moment's time, so please just do stick around for that. Uh, I just want to say goodbye to you, Liz, as well. Thank you very much for being here uh, throughout the course of the show. We mentioned right at the start as well that you've got a lot going on at the moment uh, and another really exciting venture opening up in a, a couple of weeks' time, uh, bakery and patisserie coming. Uh -huh. uh, so yet another bit of pressure to put yourself under. But someone who likes to be busy, I think it's fair to say anyway. Yeah, I think it's... Um... It's, it, it's good pressure. It's not bad. Um, you know, we, we just want to, as a team, we want to be um, expressing ourselves cul culinary in lots of different ways. So it's just a really nice kind of way to play with something different, really. Yeah, yeah. And, and we can expect some interesting takes on high tea. Uh, yeah. Did I see uh, Bloody Mary sourdough? You did. I, mm. I thought so. You did. Okay. Yeah. yeah. yeah I, I mean, I love making an event out of food. Um, pure and simple really and I think afternoon teen has kind of just been crying out for a little bit of an update for a while and um the whole ceremony of um of of, of the afternoon teen kind of like vibe I think um it just lends itself to other meals of the day as well so yeah. being able to kind of have lots of different things for breakfast for lunch for dinner it's um it's kind of a, a fun way to enjoy food I right think. and where will it be it's in Boston Spa okay yep um and uh, yeah, I, I, I'm really hoping it'll be open in the next couple of weeks. Yeah, well, good luck with that. Thank, thank you, you once again for being here. Uh, and thank you very much to all our guests as well. Melanie, thank you very much to you. Uh, Lawrence bringing the booze, thank you very much to you. More, more, of course, as well. It was great to get out to uh, Hyde Park with Harry. Uh, Beth was at Ox Club uh, and Larry was at North Brew as well. Uh, so we've had a really, really full and rich and varied show, just like our indie scene here in Leeds. Remember to support your indie scene. We'll be back tomorrow night at the same time. Uh, right now, we couldn't talk about food and drink without entertainment, could we? Uh, so it makes me so excited to be able to say we have some live music on the programme. Uh, we'll leave you with these guys in the morning lights. We'll see you tomorrow night at the same time. It's live on Digital Food Week TV, and we're going to be performing our upcoming single, Don't Touch Your Lips. <laughs> For a night, I'm light in a dark room When nobody's watching, can you see me or who I've become? New skin for the both of us It's shed and you can see the bone still doesn't hurt Okay, maybe a little but I am ready to admit it So don't catch feelings We still soon too much Don't catch feelings I'm trapped in your room And I'm running out of things to say to you Running out of breath Just don't catch feelings For someone else Foreign ground, we spoke, we lied, we drowned. Couldn't stand your eyes on me, so heavy. A carrier, a snake in a dark room. Steady, I can feel the pulse, sin doesn't work. Think I'm hurting a little. 
but I'm ready to admit it. So don't catch feelings. It's too soon, too much. Don't catch feelings. I'm trapped in your phone, and I'm running out of things to say to you. Running out of breath. Just don't catch feelings for someone else. Running, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running out of things to say. Running, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running. What a mess I make games we play. Just don't catch feelings. It's too soon, too much. Don't catch feelings. I'm trapped in your cloud, and I'm running out of things to say to you. Running out of breath. Just don't catch feelings for someone else. Running, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running out of things to say. Running, I'm running, I'm running. Running, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running, what a miss I'm making. We play, just running out of things to say to you. Running out of breath, just don't catch feelings for someone else.